thank you very much. Uh, as before, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here, so I'd like to thank the Department of Philosophy at SUNY for doing that, and especially Andrew Collison for having me out. All right, so in my intra-level talk, I explained the problem of induction, and I discussed why I think this is a serious philosophical problem. What I want to do in this talk is explain what I take to be the most promising attempt to solve this problem. Now, in rough form, the idea is going to be this. Actually, let's start with just a really fast summary of the problem of induction. So you'll remember that there's this familiar dilemma we get from Hume, and it goes like this. The problem of induction cannot be justified a posteriori, for that looks to be question-begging or circular. But neither can the problem of induction be justified a priori, for we learn about nature through experience. And the problem of induction stands or falls with this claim that nature is uniform. So, that's the problem. But there may be a way out. The idea is that there's a certain kind of inference that we're missing in the Humean dilemma. Right? Hume considered using induction to justify induction. That looks circular. He considered using deduction by an a priori method, but that just doesn't seem apt for learning about the uniformity of nature. But he didn't consider the possibility that we might use a species of explanatory reasoning, something like an inference to the best explanation. Well, if that's on the table, we might try to justify induction in roughly the following way. Our observation of uniformities in nature justifies the postulate of necessary connections. And maybe the best theory of necessary connections will justify induction. Uh, this has been fairly widely discussed in the last 30 years or so. But recently, Helen Beebe wrote an important paper criticizing that type of solution. So the plan today is as follows. I'll start by explaining the solution in more detail. I'll explain Helen Beebe's objection to this solution. I'll try to say... I'll give an objection to Helen Beebe that requires a modification of her solution. And then I'll provide a general argument for thinking that, in fact, we can salvage this necessitarian solution to the problem of induction. So that's the plan. So if you look on your handout now, we'll come to section one, the problem. So suppose you're looking around the world, and you notice that in the past, all Fs have been Gs. F and G here just refer to any, any two properties that you like. It doesn't matter what. So you notice that all past Fs have been Gs, and you wonder whether, in addition to this, all future Fs will be Gs as well. Now, epistemological problems, such as the problem of induction, often rise in connection with our metaphysical commitments. So let's start by considering a particular view we might have about the metaphysics of the natural world. So this view is called Humeanism. Humeanism rejects the existence of special necessary connections between F and G. There just aren't any such necessary connections. Now, if you're a Humean, the problem of induction looks to be insoluble. Because if there are no necessary connections between F and G, there's no reason to think that the past regularity that all Fs are Gs is going to hold into the future. That's the fundamental concern. Right? After all, if you're a Humean, the fact that Fs have been Gs up to this point is just a matter of cosmic coincidence. We've been lucky that nature has appeared uniform thus far, but that's the best we can say. Things change when we bring another hypothesis under consideration, or so the necessitarian will think. So consider hypothesis T. T says... Properties F and G are timelessly necessarily connected, such that all Fs are Gs in virtue of the necessary connection between F and G. Now, once this hypothesis is on the table, we can reason as follows. Say, all right, take as our first premise the idea that all observed Fs have been Gs. Now, our second premise will go like this. T explains that observation better than Humeanism. Right? Humeanism treated 
the regularity as a sort of cosmic coincidence. The necessitarian solution posits this ontological entity that makes it very likely that these regularities would obtain. Now, here's a key inference. We move from one and two to three. Therefore, we have some justification for accepting T. Now, I want to make a disclaimer at this point. This is a controversial step. It's controversial for two main reasons. The first reason is that some philosophers are just very suspicious of the idea of a necessary connection at all. So the worry is that we don't have a sufficient grasp of this concept, it's not even intelligible to talk about these sorts of things, and that's an important concern. The second objection is that there's something wrong with this type of inference. So even if this is a perfectly intelligible theory, we're perfectly capable of deriving the consequences of that theory, we're not capable of this kind of explanatory reasoning. <coughs> now, if you think either of those things, you're probably going to get off the bus at this point. And some philosophers have. But that's not my interest today. I want to grant that, in principle, we're capable of making this sort of inference. And I want to grant that the concept of necessity that I'm employing here makes sense. Uh, I think, in general, most philosophers these days are open to both of these sorts of suggestions. Um, and what's noteworthy for our purposes is that Helen Beebe is open to these suggestions as well, at least in this paper. Now, my interest is going to be in what comes next. So let's look at premise four. Premise four says, if we have some justification for theory T, then we have some justification for thinking that the future will be like the past with respect to all Fs being <coughs> Now you'll notice by looking at 3 and 4, that 3 is simply the antecedent of 4, which is a conditional, so 5 follows. Therefore, we have some justification for thinking that the future will be like the past with respect to f's being g's. Now, notice what 4 is doing. 4 is telling us something that allows us to extrapolate our, past, our justification for t to regularities into the future. So it's what's doing this work and allowing us to project into the future. Um, and that's the sort of claim that interests me. That's where Helen Beebe focuses her attention and where I'd like to focus my attention. So in general, we can say that the necessitarian solution to the problem of induction boils down to the following two claims. The first claim is that we're justified in postulating necessary connections. So in criticizing the inference from one and two to three by criticizing the intelligibility of necessity or by criticizing inference to the best explanation, you'd be objecting to this sort of principle. But the second claim that the solution rests on is the claim that the best theory of necessary connections entails the timeless uniformity of nature. And for my purposes, this is the claim that I'm interested in. So what I'm going to try to do is defend claim B. So it'll help to just take A for granted, but even, even if you don't, there's this question, all right, uh, does the solution to the problem of induction succeed in, on, on this stage, at this step? All right. Now, what's interesting is that if we followed the solution thus far, I've been talking about F and G. These are just stand-ins. It looks like, in principle, this sort of solution can be generalized to all observed regularities. <coughs> now, it appears that this is, in some sense, an empirical argument, because premise one is empirical. So it's not purely a priori. We're not violating the, the claim that we should learn about nature through experience. But in the same sense, we haven't relied on an inductive, ar inductive inference at any point. So it looks like we've avoided that Humean dilemma. 
That's why I think this is a potentially promising solution that's worth exploring. So, with that said, let's get to Helen Beebe's objection. Why doesn't she like this? Well, she's ultimately going to reject the inference from 1 and 2 to 3, but not in one of the ways that I mentioned. <clears throat> what she's going to do is posit a competing theory. This competing theory is going to have all the explanatory virtues of theory T, but it's not going to entail the uniformity of nature. So she's going to say, look, this is a necessitarian theory, so you could be justified in accepting my version of a necessitarian theory, but that still wouldn't get you the necessary, or the timeless uniformity of nature. So it's a way of satisfying this guy while rejecting this guy. So how does she do this? Well, she says, ah, I, ha I have a solution, or I have a suggestion here. Let's consider the following hypothesis. That F and G have been necessarily connected so far. Hence, SF for so far. Now, this is a really beautifully simple and elegant uh, challenge that we have. Why do I say that this is a beautiful challenge? Well, think about it like this. You might look at these two theories and say, all right, there's some sort of relation between the two. SF is committing us to less. It's making a weaker claim than T, right? It's sort of not committing to whether or not F and G will be necessarily com connected in the future, but it leaves it open that that could be the case. It's just not taking a stand. T, on the other hand, claims that S, sorry, F and G have been necessarily connected so far, and they will continue to be necessarily connected in the future. So it's a weaker claim. But the thought is that it has just as many explanatory benefits. If you imagine that this theory were true, it looks like that would offer a great explanation of the fact that you have observed all past Fs being Gs, right? Every F you've been able to observe has either, is either in the present or the past. This theory explains why you've made that observation. But notice that if all I tell you is that F and G have been necessarily connected so far, you're not in the position to infer that they'll be connected in the future. Because maybe they'll just stop being necessarily connected. This hypothesis leaves it open. So what this suggests is this. So I want to put this a little bit differently. Um, when we think about what it is for one theory to be a good explanation, there are at least two different criteria we might have in mind. One criteria is just the degree to which the theory makes the observation likely. And what I've just argued is that this theory and this theory, so SF and T, are on a par with their ability to make past regularities likely. The other virtue has to do with like, the initial plausibility of a theory, or the plausibility that that theory has independently of any kind of experience. But there's a very straightforward argument for thinking that the initial plausibility of this theory is higher than the initial plausibility of this one. And it's this. This theory is essentially like a big disjunction it reads like this. Either F and G have been timelessly necessarily connected, or F and G are necessarily connected up until time X, whenever that is. Or S and G, F and G are timelessly necessarily connected up until time Y. Or F and G are necessary. You see where this is going, right? So if this is a disjunction, and this is one of the disjuncts, as long as the other disjuncts of this guy have a probability of greater than zero, this guy is, all things considered, more likely to be true than this. And it's all, or sorry, I shouldn't say all things considered. Independently of our observation, this guy is more likely to be true than this guy. It's also all things considered more likely to be true. But the one we care about is that independently of any experience, 
independently of observed regularities, this guy's better. So in both virtues then, it looks like SF either ties or beats theory T. And yet, it does not justify induction. So that's Helen Beebe's argument in a nutshell. <coughs> now there is one, one additional thing I, yeah, I'll save it for later. Well, let's move on. So let's get straight to uh, first a technical point that I want to make about Beebe's argument. So I'm going to quibble a little bit with the logic of her argument, the way that she has set up the logical <coughs> And then I'm going to say how I think it needs to be uh, reframed so that it avoids this logical difficulty. So here's an analogy, what I think is an analogous situation to our question about natural regularities. All right, so suppose that you have just been resoundingly defeated in a game of poker. Now, your opponent is a well-known card shark who somehow received the very best hand on every hand in which she was dealing. Now here are two hypotheses you might wish to consider when thinking about this situation. Either no one cheated, the card shark was just having a lucky game, or the card shark cheated. Now it seems to me that you probably have good reason not to want to continue playing this opponent. And what you'll say is that your opponent's cheating offers a better explanation than your opponent's playing fair in the absence of cheating. So this looks like a legitimate epistemic preference on your part. It's just not, it's not merely pragmatic. You have some reason to think it's true that uh, you would lose if you were to continue playing. Well. Let's now consider a few additional hypotheses. This is where the interesting action is going to lie. So in your handout, I'm now reading hypothesis C at the top of page two. So the head of the Nevada Game and Control Board has an irrational dislike of philosophers and hates to see them win their first game against any given opponent. Now we're assuming that the head of the Nevada Game and Control Board has some sort of magical powers over cards regardless of where they're played. That seems reasonable, right? Um, and as, as it turns out, uh, it was she, <coughs> not your opponent, who rigged the decks against you. So, now the way I've specified this, you know, the head of the Nevada Game and Control Board is not going to mess with any future games. It's only the first game against philosophers where she has this, where she uses her powers, all right? Okay, I suspect most of you won't like that hypothesis, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. Hypothesis D reads, a competent cheater who wanted you to lose, cheated. Now here's the question. Originally, I assumed that you would prefer B, right, the hypothesis that your opponent cheated. Now I've asked you to consider hypothesis D, the hypothesis that someone cheated. Maybe it was your opponent. Maybe it was someone else. Hypothesis D doesn't say. And the question is, does consideration of hypothesis D change your mind? Does that give you a reason not to want to play it? Or does it give you a reason to think, oh, I, I guess it would be okay for me to play the card chart again? I think the answer is no. And I think the reason should be fairly obvious. Hypothesis D, the hypothesis that it's merely someone who cheated, and hypothesis B, the hypothesis that your opponent cheated, are compatible with one another. In fact, you should accept D after learning about it, given that you've already accepted B. But this doesn't somehow undermine or remove the reason you had for accepting the hypothesis that your opponent cheated in the first place. To change your mind and get you to think, ah, oh, maybe it would be a good idea for me to play the card shark again, you'd have to find some reason to prefer hypothesis C, right? the head of the Nevada Gaming Control Board hypothesis, <coughs> to, to the hypothesis that your opponent cheated. And I don't think any of us will do that. So the end result then is something like this. You don't need to undermine hypothesis D in order 
to justify your preference not to play the card shark again. Why does this matter? Well, the way that Helen Beebe sets up her objection, she says that the necessitarian, or the proponent of the necessitarian solution to the problem of induction, has to provide reason to think that theory T is better than SF. So the challenge is, show that this hypothesis is better than this one. That's the wrong challenge. You're going to accept this one if you like theory T. And you're going to think that this is more likely to be true than theory T. But that doesn't take away the justification you already have for accepting T. Right? So the thought then is this. What we need to do is find a hypothesis, not like SF, but some narrower necessitarian hypothesis that's analogous to the example in which the head of the Nevada Game and Control Board was messing with your cards. Right? We need to find some specific necessitarian hypothesis that fails, on which induction ends up failing. So for example, I'm going to call this hypothesis 540 because it's the hypothesis that F and G have been necessarily connected so far and will remain connected up until 5.40 p.m. So you've got nine more minutes of uniformity, according to this hypothesis. So my worry then is this. BB's incorrect to ask, a, ask us to find a reason to prefer T to this hypothesis. What we need is a reason to prefer T to hypotheses like this one. Now, at this point, uh, I want to make a very quick suggestion. Um, this is actually a suggestion that BB considers, which is why I want to highlight it here. <coughs> And the suggestion is that we might appeal to some criterion of theoretical simplicity. Something that says, other things being equal, simpler hypotheses are preferable to more complex hypotheses. Now, what you might think at this point is that a hypothesis like this includes a special temporal parameter. Whatever kind of thing a law is, for this theory to be true, the law has to be somehow sensitive to what time it is. So whatever kind of thing a law is, it has to be have this complicating feature. It's got this temporal parameter built in. It doesn't look like you need any such temporal parameter if this theory is true. So, if you like theoretical considerations of simplicity, we might be able to find a reason there for preferring hypothesis T to some of these non-induction justifying necessitarian hypotheses. Right? The guys that act like the, the deviant disjuncts of SF. Now, I myself think that simplicity is sort of a, a blunt tool. Um, I'm not quite sure how much stock I want to put in it. But I do think it's somewhat plausible that T is simpler than this sort of hypothesis. The difficulty for BB is that she doesn't consider that. What she considers is the question whether T is simpler than this guy. And her response is, I think, her response is that it isn't simpler than this guy in any way that matters because this is initially more plausible than T. Um, but I'm not sure that that works. <coughs> once we consider the more precise, carefully specified, necessitarian hypothesis. Okay, so that being said, if I don't want to rest my objection on considerations of simplicity, uh, what do I want to do? Well, I want to discuss a general strategy. Um, in order to define the different ways of thinking about the world that are going to be involved in this strategy, I want to first introduce a couple of uh, fairly well-known concepts. Um, these have to do with the metaphysics of properties. So let's suppose that you, you go around and you start classifying objects in the world. 
Now here are two possible classifications you might make. You might say, all right, first I'm looking at a class that is just a class of all electrons. Second, you might say, all right, let's consider the class that consists of, <coughs> I don't know, the empty set, my face, the Eiffel Tower, and the planet Jupiter. Now, you might think that one of these classes does a better job of picking out a genuine category of things in the world than the other class. Namely, you might think that all the members of this class, all the electrons, have some, something genuinely in common with one another. It may be that no such commonality, no such similarity, no special intrinsic resemblance can be found among the members of this class. Plato would say that this classification carves nature at the joints. This one does not. Now, the term for this is that, to say that this class is a natural class, whereas this class is non-natural. Why, why does this matter? Well, there's the background question that we're asking when we ask about the metaphysics of properties uh, in part has to do with the question, which properties are there? What are the actual properties that exist in the world as compared to the properties that maybe we've just invented? Now if you think that this is a reasonable distinction, you buy this idea, what you'll want to say is that the properties that really exist are the natural properties. Whereas the properties that you know, maybe we've just invented, or maybe just kind of fall out of linguistic practices, these needn't necessarily be natural. They're non-natural. One more term. If you think that uh, properties are such that there's a special set of them, so not every predicate refers to a property, that's the thesis that there are sparse properties, or properties are sparse. And the general way of thinking is that all and only natural properties are sparse properties. Okay. So, with that in mind, there are four theories that I want us to consider. Uh, these are four different theories about the fundamental <coughs> types of primitives that are relevant to our question having to do with the problem of induction. So, what are they? The first hypothesis I will call unstructured humanism. Now, unstructured humanism holds this. There is one type of primitive. You have a space-time, and it's not described by sparse properties at all. It's just full of abundant properties. So the idea here is something like this. In this kind of world, there is no neat division between natural and non-natural properties. Every property is sort of on equal footing. Now, if you like, you can think of it this way. <coughs> According to unstructured humanism, the world is like a lump of Plato. It may have a shape, so a determinate topology and geometry, but if you want to start slicing up the Plato into different parts and classify things, no one way of doing that is at all privileged. No, way is, no one way of slicing up the piece of Plato is better or worse than any other way of doing so. The second hypothesis I will call structured humanism. This view accepts that there are two types of primitives. We have space-time, but we also say that it's full of sparse natural properties. 
So on this view, the world is like a world that's built out of Lego bricks. If you have a world built out of Lego bricks, there will be certain objective ways of classifying different pieces of the world, right? You'll be able to say, ah, we can classify the group of all pieces that have, you know, four connectors on them and lump those all together. That demarcates a natural class. We have the class of all the red pieces. That demarcates a natural class. And we'll succeed at describing the world insofar as we get those classifications right. Alright, so these are two Humean kind of views. The ones that are most interesting to us, though, are the necessitarian views that build on these. So, <clears throat> let's consider a view that I call unstructured necessitarianism. This view is like structured Humeanism in that it endorses a space-time with sparse natural properties. So, it's as though the world is built from Legos, but it adds something. The thought is that a Humean world is not quite rich enough to explain all the facts we want to explain. So, for example, if we look around and see that, oh, the Legos are distributed in regular patterns, that's something we'd like to explain. That seems like the sort of fact that the Humean theories are incapable of explaining. So we might want to add a necessary connection into the mix. But here's the feature of unstructured necessitarianism. It's called unstructured because it places no constraints on the form that the necessary <coughs> connections have to take. So, as an analogy, we might think of it like this. The world is like Legos, but your parents have given you certain rules. They might mandate that on Tuesdays you only build houses. And they might prohibit you from ever building, I don't know, spaceships. There's no rhyme or reason to what their mandates or their rules or their prohibitions might be. Anything might go. But that's the sort of situation that you're in. And finally, we have the thesis I'll call structured necessitarianism. The thought behind structured necessitarianism is this. It's like structured humanism again, in saying that we have space-time, sparse properties, so the world is as though it's built out of Legos. But, it, it differs with respect to the way it describes these necessary connections. Namely, the necessary connections themselves have to be sparse. Now, if you think back to our original theory here, the idea is that this necessary connection is a kind of relation that holds between properties F and G. So, the thought is that this relation is being treated as sparse relation on this view, but not necessarily, but it's not sparse on this view, it could be anything. So, again, the world is built as, is like a, a world built out of Legos. It does have restrictions, but you might think of it this way. The restrictions are based on the kinds of connections that hold between pieces. For example, you might look, this is not a perfect analogy with uh, theory T, but you might look at the pieces and think, ah, because there are different sorts of connections, like little bumps on the different Legos, they can only be joined together in certain ways. So any structure you build is going to be based on the nature of these connections. So we come now to, we can actually get to my solution. Right. Why do, how do I think we can respond to Beebe's challenge? By thinking about these four theories. Well, note first that in the first stage of this argument, if we grant this premise, we're effectively saying, all right, we can be justified in postulating some kind of necessary connection. So we'll, we'll grant that for now. Now, given that, there are two claims that the necessitarian who wishes to justify induction must defend. The first claim is this. 
We know a priori that structured ontologies are preferable to unstructured ontologies. So we know that structured humanism is better than unstructured humanism, and we, we know this because we have some kind of a priori insight, similarly for the two necessitarian theories. And the second claim is this. Structured necessitarianism guarantees some degree of natural uniformity. So I'll just say a little bit more about these two claims, why I think they're plausible, and then I will conclude. Okay, so the first claim that structured uh, ontologies are better than unstructured ontologies uh, should, shouldn't be too terribly controversial these days. Um, most philosophers are more or less on board with the natural, non-natural distinction, and they endorse the thesis that there are sparse properties. Well, why? Um, if we think about the dispute between unstructured and structured humians, we might say this. Look, uh, unstructured humanism in one sense gives us too much to work with. <coughs> it's, like, we can do, um, like, anything can go. I should, I should phrase that differently. Anything goes. Anything you want to say about the world can be fine. Because you can parse up the world, categorize things out any way you like. So anything goes. So there's, there's too much here. On the other hand, there's not enough. Because you might think, well, if I'm actually trying to base my metaphysical conclusions on something, I need to get in there and see what the world is like. But there's just nothing to the world, really. It's just all this, it's a homogenous lump. So there's not enough to go on there. Um, I think also... What's, what's going on here is just that we find the idea of structure to be intuitive. We take it that the world is structured, and that ultimately is what motivates the kind of move towards structured theories. So now let me say something about claim two. Why I think that structured necessitarianism somehow supports the uniformity of nature. Well, I think on one level it's, a, it's, it's sort of intuitive. If you just think, all right, because the necessary connections are sparse, there's a limited stock of them. So if there's a limited stock of these guys, certain repetitions are bound to start happening. Right? We're going to be able to find some way of generalizing about what sorts of things result from the necessary connections we have, just because there's a limited stock. A more precise way of doing so, I think, is to think back to these four theories here. With SF, we have a theory that's just totally open between what sort of necessitarian, necessitarianism we have. So let's ignore that. What we want to compare is theory T with this deviant, non-induction justifying necessitarian. Now here's the thought. A necessary connection that is time constrained is going to have to take some strange form. It's going to have to be either a relation between non-natural properties, like as in the case of a gruesome property, like the property of being f before time t and g afterwards. Or it's going to have to be involve a relation that is somehow involving this <coughs> temporal parameter and either way, we get a result that it looks like this is less of a good candidate to be one of our sparse necessary connections than we would if we consider theory T. According to theory T, we just simply have universals F and G. We have a relation that holds between them. And because of the kind of thing that universals are, because universals are constant through space and time, it seems natural to think that a natural relation is going to bind them at all times, if it binds them at all. And so for that reason, I think it's likely that structured necessitarianism is going to ensure at least some degree of natural regularity. Now ultimately, I don't think that what I've said in this talk is enough to, to, to constitute a compelling argument for thinking either that this is the theory we should accept, or that 
we can justify claim uh, that second claim, namely that it guarantees a certain degree of natural regularity. Uh, but in the full-length paper, I spend a lot more time talking about the metaphysics of universals in an attempt to fully develop that and make it more sort of obvious why it is that we should think that this is how things go. So to sum up then, what I've tried to suggest is that in the end, we don't need to show that T is better than SF. What we do need to show is that T is better than the deviant, non-induction justifying, necessitarian theories that are also compatible with SF. But that we have a good reason for potentially thinking that T is better. This is an a priori reason, and at rock bottom it's this. T is compatible with or respects certain hypotheses that we like in the metaphysics of universals and of fundamentality. The non-induction justifying hypotheses do not.